Good evening, and welcome to the keynote address for the inaugural Social Justice in Action Conference, co-sponsored by Union Presbyterian Seminary's Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation and the Leadership Institute. Following the presentation this evening, we will open up to audience questions, so please enter your questions in the chat. Dr. Rodney Sadler is the Associate Professor of Bible at Union Presbyterian Seminary and the Director of the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation. Dr. Sadler, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Mike. It is wonderful to be with you all this evening. I am pleased to be able to be at this keynote address that will conclude our first uh, joint conference between the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation and the Leadership Institute called Called to Justice. We are pleased tonight to have as our keynote speaker, the Reverend Dr. Marvin McMickel, who will present a conversation called Building on a Firm Foundation. The Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation is an organ of Union Presbyterian Seminary that's primary focus is to talk about the prophetic dimensions of Christian ministry. We are thrilled to be able to have you with us today, and we're excited about the work that not only we will talk about tonight, but that you will continue to do in the, the places where you're located, in your congregations, in your communities, as you bring forward that larger social justice message that Jesus Christ brought forward many years ago. Thank you so much, and let me turn it over now to the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary, the Reverend Dr. Brian Blunt. Thank you very much, Rodney. I am delighted to be with all of you this evening to talk about our speaker, to give you a little bit of an introduction as to his background uh, so that uh, we can whet our appetite for the lecture that he's going to be sharing with us. The Reverend Dr. Marvin A. McMickle, is the director of the Doctor of Ministry program and professor of African-American religious studies at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. Dr. McMickle is a graduate of Aurora College. He received his Master of Divinity degree at Union Theological Seminary in New York City and has also done graduate study at Columbia University. He received a Doctor of Ministry degree from Princeton Theological Seminary and later received the Doctor of Philosophy degree from Case Western Reserve University. His dissertation was entitled The Film Portrayal of the Black Preacher Since 1925. A native of Chicago, he now resides in Rochester, New York, where in 2019 he retired after a stellar tenure as the 12th president of Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School. Prior to joining, Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. He was pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio from 1987 to 2011, and a member of the Board of Trustees of Cleveland State University in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. McMickle was also the professor of homiletics at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio from 1996 to 2011. Upon retiring from Ashland, the faculty named him Professor Emeritus. He is the author of 15 books and dozens of articles that regularly appear in professional journals and magazines. His writings also appear in Feasting on the Word and Preaching God's Transforming Justice, two recent preaching commentaries. He is a member of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Board of Preachers at Morehouse College in Atlanta, and has also served as a visiting professor of preaching at Yale University Divinity School. Tonight, we are blessed and eager to hear his closing keynote address, Building a Firm Foundation. Dr. McMickle, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Drs. Uh, Blunt and uh, also Sadler. Uh, I wanna begin by first expressing words of gratitude and appreciation for the invitation to come and to be a part of this evening's event. Thankful that uh, the seminary is looking at ministry through the lens of social justice and trying to challenge the church to think about the ways in which we can more effectively engage in the world. So I'm grateful for the privilege of being able to share with all of you and thanks to both of you for the invitation. I do have some slides that I'm going to attempt to pull up and uh, if I am successful, we'll proceed with them. 
And if I am not, then we'll go without them. But um, let me just see here if I can find anything. All right, I don't think, I think when we, when we turned things over to the other screen, uh, I wasn't able to, uh, to do them. So I won't bother with them. I won't tie us up with that. Let me um, begin uh, by saying, first of all, that this is a continuation of the discussion that we had on yesterday in the workshop that dealt with the look of uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and the question of who will be a witness for the Lord. So rather than the topic of building on the firm foundation, because I wasn't able to finish yesterday's discussion, I just want to carry over uh, to today what we talked about on yesterday and then bring things to an end. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, as I began on yesterday, is one of those moments between the resurrection of Jesus on the one hand and the ascension on the other when the disciples have an opportunity to ask one last question of Jesus or to raise one last issue or to seek one last moment of direction and uh, clarity about what their next move should be. I asked the people on yesterday, as I will ask those of you tonight, if that were you and you had the opportunity to ask anything you wanted of the living Jesus, face to face, knowing that that would be the last time that you would see him face to face, what would you ask for? What would you what would you seek? Would you would you be like the earlier prophet who asked of his predecessor that you give me a double portion of your wisdom? If you could ask anything of the Lord, what would you have asked for? And this is what the disciples said. In Acts 1, chapter, verse 6, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That sounds like a fairly uh, insignificant question in a fairly insignificant passage, except that everything in that question is wrong. Let's take it apart in four sections. Number one, Lord, will you? Now, after three years with Jesus, you would have thought that they would have had some idea of what it was that he was expecting them to do. After all, he did say to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So for three years, they've been with Jesus. And by the way, he's done a great many things during those three years. But their question was not, Lord, what do you want us to do? Their question was, what are you going to do next? So that's the first flaw in the question. The second part of the question is wrong with respect to the time frame. Lord, will you at this time? This is clearly a messianic question. They're clearly operating under the impression that Jesus is the Messiah that he has in point of fact come as they believe the Messiah would to alter the political landscape of first century Palestine. They were hoping that he would break them free from the succession of conquering nations that had occupied their homeland from the Egyptians to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to the Greeks and to the Romans. Now they thought surely the Messiah will restore us to the days of our glory under the days of David and Solomon. Will you at this time, since you're leaving and it hasn't happened yet, will you at this time do what we hope the Messiah would do? No. Question number three, will you at this time restore this takes us back to the messianic question. Will you take us back to our golden age? Will you take us back to the time when we were more secure in our political standing? Will you take us back to the time when we were the preeminent nation in the world? Now, it was at that point on yesterday, and I will do so again today, begin to play with the phrase, 
that they wanted Jesus to make Israel great again. Here is where the social justice component of tonight's talk will begin. That there is still even in this country a desire not to see what new thing God may have in store for our country and for God's world, but rather a, a hungering and a thirsting to be restored to some earlier time, which for some people in our country is a time that they prefer to the moment in which we are now alive. Make Israel great again. Take us back to the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century, the days of David and Solomon, the days of the United Kingdom. Take us back to the time when things were better for us. There are people still in the world who want to make America great again. Now, I have no problem with the first three words. Make America great. All of us want to live in a great nation, depending, of course, on how we define the word great and what greatness looks like. Greatness might mean that we are great enough to provide for all of our citizens. Greatness might mean that we can provide health care for all of our people. Greatness might mean equal protection under the law, and when one has an encounter with the police, one does not fear for one's life. Make America great. All of us want to make America great. The question is the word again. From a social justice point of view, when is that again? To what time do people who want to make America great again, to what time do they wish to return? Or to what social arrangement do they wish to return? Or to what power balance do they wish to return? What is the meaning of the word again? Make America great again? The 1950s? The teeth of the Jim Crow South? Make America great again? The turn of the 20th century, before women had the right to vote, make America great again. The middle of the 19th century, when Native Americans were the victims of intentional and systematic elimination, make America great again. The 18th century, when the transatlantic slave trade was going on, exactly when was it that we want to go back to make America great again? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And then this one, to Israel. There were Egyptians in the world. They did not really want them in their kingdom. There were Greeks in the world. They did not want them in their kingdom. They told the Lord exactly who it was they wanted to include. Will you make Israel great again? Jesus did not answer their question. He didn't give them the timetable that they wanted. Instead, he gave them an assignment. I want to move quickly through the assignment and then come to the locations in which he wanted that assignment to be undertaken. He said to them, I want you to be my witnesses. That's the theme I want to interject throughout tonight. I want you to be my witnesses. Think with me about what the word witness might suggest. A witness is someone, first of all, who sees something. A witness is someone who is paying attention to what is going on in the world around him or her. A witness is an observer of the events that are going on right in front of their eyes. Part of the challenge of social justice is to see the inequities that need to be corrected. Part of the work of social justice is to pay attention to where injustice is being manifest. Part of the work of social justice is to know what the world should look like and then be able to contrast that with the way in which the world now is. In one of his famous speeches, Frederick Douglass talked about the work of the poet and the prophet and the reformer. 
the poet and the prophet and the reformer, he said, are people who paint pictures of the way in which the world should be, and they do so by contrasting the way the world now is. You cannot be a prophet. You cannot be a reformer. You can't be a poet. You can't be an effective Christian preacher. You cannot do the work of social justice if you are not seeing the world as it is. Be my witness. Secondly, said uh, 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 Jesus, be my witness in terms of saying something about what you have seen. Here's where the work of social justice becomes more complicated. It is one thing to see it. Some folks refuse even to do that. It is another thing to publicly say something, offer some critique, provide some rebuke, lift up some uh, admonishment about what you have seen. The challenge for social justice is not just in the seeing. The challenge for social justice is in the saying. Think about the courtroom now. Think about taking the oath uh, as you're being sworn in as a witness. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's the work of the prophet, of the social reformer to tell the truth, to tell the whole truth, to tell nothing but the truth, to not, to not cut short for fear you might offend somebody or disturb somebody or dislodge the status quo. Part of the work of social justice is saying things that have to be said in order to arrange things the way they need to be arranged. I give you a word that I used on yesterday, and I will spell it for you, absent the slide. The word is parhesia. It is spelled P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A, P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. It, it pops up both in classical Greek and in Koine Greek. In classical Greek, it pops up with Socrates in Athens, in the moments before he was forced to drink the hemlock and be poisoned to death. Socrates says in his final uh, speech, I know why you want me dead, he said. It is because of my parhesia, which translates in two parts, bold speech without regard to the consequences that might come to the speaker. Bold speech without regard to the consequences that might come to the speaker. That's the root of social transformation. People who are saying bold things who are not restrained by the fear of what the consequences might be to them if they say it. Now, there may be consequences to those who hear what they say and don't act on it. Take the 8th century prophets, take Amos, take Micah, take Hosea. Their bold speech was what God was going to do if Israel did not repent and return to the uh, outlines of the covenant. The people did not listen. The people did not obey. 25 years later, they wish they had because they heard the bold speech, but they did not respond to it. Our job as preachers and as prophets and as reformers is not to be certain that people will hear us and respond to us. Our job is to engage in parhesia and leave people to struggle within themselves about how they will respond. But if we don't run the risk of saying it, then we have two problems. The first problem is that we have failed the people. The second problem is that we have failed God. Think about Ezekiel chapters 3 and 33. Think about the watchman or the watcher. Think about God saying, now if I tell you to say something to the people, 
and you choose not to say it because you are concerned that in saying it, you might upset them. You might disturb them. You might trouble them. They may not like what you have to say. If I tell you to say something, but you don't say it, two things will happen. One, they will die because they failed to receive the warning that you could have given them. And two, their sins will be on your head. That's if you don't say what I tell you to say. On the other hand, if I tell you to give them a warning and you give it to them and they do not listen to you, two things will happen. They will face the consequences of not having heard what you had to say, but you will have saved your soul because you did what I asked you to do. Social transformation, social justice, the creation of what Josiah Royce and John Lewis and Martin Luther King Jr. refer to as the beloved community, all of that occurs on the other side of parkesia, of bold speech, of setting forth the ought, of confronting the reasons why that ought has not yet been fulfilled and then sending people on the journey toward achieving that ultimate goal. See something. Pay attention to what's happening in our world. See wealth disparities. See the, the continued death of African Americans either in police custody or in some encounter with the police. Uh, Dr. Blunt just referenced my time in Rochester. Well. Rochester is back in the news again because a man who was in mental distress was on the streets of Rochester last year, naked, having a mental meltdown. His family called the police because they were concerned about his mental condition. The police showed up in force, seven or eight of them, while he was lying in the street. He said that uh, he had COVID-19, and so they put him uh, on the ground, face down, and put a, a, a sack over his head so he could not spit at them. And very soon, between being forced onto the ground and having this sack over his head, uh, the cause of death was named as asphyxiation. He was having a mental breakdown. The solution was not to be killed. The solution was to be escorted to a place where help could come. They then had a hearing to judge whether or not there was any responsibility on the part of the police as regards the death of this man. And just two days ago, the results came back. No police officer faces any consequences for the death of that man. The same thing is true in Aurora, Colorado, where a young man was walking home and he was stopped along the way because the police said, we have the right to stop you because you are appearing uh, to be strange and curious and, and suspect of something. And so they stopped him and they put him on the ground and they sat on him and they injected him with something to calm him down. And he died as a result of that encounter. It was then announced two days ago again that the police in Aurora had absolutely no reason to stop that young man whatsoever. But he's dead and no charges were brought. See something. You cannot change the world if you are not paying attention to it. See the assault on the U.S. Capitol. See the rise of QAnon. See the rise of the Proud Boys. See the rise of the Oath Keepers. See what is happening with the swelling power of white supremacy. See members of Congress who want to bring firearms onto the floor of the United States Congress a witness sees something. Ah, but having seen it, a witness says something about what they have seen. And then the third piece of being a witness, 
see something, say something. Now we come to the Greek word for witness. The Greek word for witness is martoria. It is the basis for the English language word martyr. Jesus is not simply inviting his disciples to perform baptism or serve communion or make hospital calls or do graveside funerals or stay in the study, stay in the confines of their uh, church studies and offices and, 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 and ponder spiritual things. Jesus says, be my martyria. I'm not sure that he's inviting them to suffer death, though so they did. I think for us, what he's asking is, what are you and I prepared to risk for the sake of the world that we want to see happen? What price are we prepared to pay? What friend are we prepared to lose? There's a congressman in Illinois uh, who voted to proceed with the impeachment of President Donald Trump. That congressman was immediately censured by the Republican Party of Illinois. And he was then publicly disowned by his family because they thought that his going against Donald Trump was almost a demonic act. As if that wasn't bad enough, Franklin Graham, uh, the son of the noted global evangelist Billy Graham, went on record as saying, that those Republicans who voted for the impeachment of Donald Trump were the moral equivalent of Judas, who, when he kissed Jesus and betrayed him into the hands of his enemies, uh, had shown himself to be unfaithful. Really? The congressman from Illinois who votes to impeach Donald Trump and Judas who kisses Jesus, that, that's the same thing? The question then is, will we take the risks that might result in any negative consequence? The rebuke by a political friend or foe, the judgment from some member of our family, the public critique of some national evangelist who thinks that he or she or they are the last word on what righteousness is or is not, Will we suffer anything for the sake of the world that we are trying to build? Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr., was noted for this one phrase, if a person has not found something for which they are prepared to die, they are not fit to live. I'm not inviting you to go out and get yourself killed. I'm asking you, what do you care enough about that you would risk something for the sake of seeing that thing achieved? Risk something for LGBTQ rights. Risk something to advance the cause of women in ministry. Risk something for the expansion of the social safety network. Risk something for the sake of DACA, deferred action on children or childhood arrivals for immigrants and for the for the notion of expanding the rights of citizenship. What are we prepared to risk in order to achieve the world that we have in mind? So the first thing that Jesus said was, I want you to be my witness. To see things as he sees things to say things that may be controversial, but that need to be said. And if, we, and if we choose not to say them, we fail both God and ourselves. And then martyria, to suffer something. If every time we preach, 
at the end of the service, everybody comes to the receiving line, smiling, eager to shake our hand, can't wait to get to us because they found that sermon so uplifting, so inspiring, so encouraging. If that's what you get week after week after week after week after week, there's something missing. Every now and then, if you are a preacher, there ought to be a Sunday when some folk walk out the other door because you have taken them into a place where they did not want to go. You've asked of them something that they did not want to give. You have held up a mirror in front of them an image of themselves they do not want to see. Be my witness. Now, that's the what. Be my witness. The next thing that Jesus does is he gives them the where. W-H-E-R-E. -E. Where does Jesus want us to go to be his witness. And he gives four places. Number one, in Jerusalem. Number two, in Judea. Number three, in Samaria. Number four, to the ends of the earth. Let's take those in order. Begin with the first one. Be my witness in Jerusalem. This means for us, 21st century church, that your ministry begins in your community. Do not worry overly about the starving children of Haiti if there are starving children around the corner from your church or across the street or somewhere in your town, do not try to save the people of China if the people in your own community are sinking beneath the weight of poverty, beneath the weight of unemployment, beneath the weight of inadequate housing and nutrition. Be my witness in Jerusalem. I know lots of Christians who delight in telling me all the money they have spent uh, to support programs and people in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. You are to be commended for everything you do like that. I have nothing to say about that except good. But I want to add an addendum. While you are sending your money around the world, have you taken an inventory of what's across the street? In one of my books entitled Caring Pastors and Caring People, I talk about a ministry that has what I call concentric circles. You know, when you drop a stone into a body of water and uh, depending upon the size of the stone and the depth of the water, it creates outwardly flowing circles. That is the nature of Christian ministry. It ought to be an outwardly flowing circle, caring pastors, caring people. The first circle is the care that the pastor gives to the congregation. So these are the standard pastoral tasks. You baptize, you preach, you provide communion, you provide hospital calls, you provide funeral support, you provide counseling, you provide Bible study. This is the pastor's job. That's the first concentric circle. The second circle is as the pastor is equipping the congregation to take care of one another. There's a wonderful story um, in the Gospel of Luke about the death of Lazarus and uh, Mary and Martha. And uh, Jesus is told that uh, Lazarus, whom you love, is dead, or no, is sick and, and is dying. Uh, so come and, and heal him before he dies. Lazarus, whom you love, is sick 
and near death. Come. And Jesus does not come for four days. We know this part of the story. When he gets there, Mary and Martha are completely, totally, and thoroughly angry with him. And they tell him so upon his arrival. But buried in that story about Lazarus, excuse me, it's in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Buried in that story about Lazarus is this, that the people of that city, Bethany, had gone to the house of Mary and Martha to comfort them. They had been, they had been trained within their synagogue system not to simply wait for the rabbi to show up, but to go themselves and comfort those who are sick and dying. That's what happens in Jerusalem. We take care of one another. Sometimes the pastor takes care of us. Sometimes we take care of one another. Whether Jesus or the pastor ever show up, we have learned how to be that second circle of care. But the third circle of care, is when the congregation begins to care for the people who are just outside its door. The people who are just outside its door, perhaps not even in its membership, just outside its door. Be my witness in Jerusalem, both in your church and in your community and in your city. Let your light shine. But then go be my witness in Judea. That's our country. That's the United States of America. What do you have to say about the present state of things in the United States of America? Do we need a word from the Lord on any particular topic or do you think that everything is just as it should be? What do we say about life? right now in the United States of America. What do we say about what just happened in Texas and about people who don't even live in the state of Texas overseeing an electrical grid that is cut off from the electricity of the rest of the country so when a storm hit Texas, albeit a once perhaps in a 50 year cycle, there were people who were living in Texas, I mean in all of Texas, North Texas, South Texas, East Texas, West Texas, who spent five and six days in the dark, colder inside than it was outside. And Ted Cruz decides this is a good time to go on a vacation to Cancun. And the Attorney General goes off to Utah and the former governor, Rick Perry, says, we in Texas would rather spend three or four days in the dark than have the federal government interfere with our business. Be my witness. On behalf of all the people in this country who cannot speak for themselves, be my witness. In the face of all of the injustices that we see playing out in our country every day, be my witness. After the 2020 election, the first thing that happened in Georgia, the first thing that happened in Iowa, the first thing that happened in Arizona, the first thing that happened in Pennsylvania, the first thing they did in Wisconsin, having had the biggest voter turnout in our nation's history in decades, the first thing they decided to do was deal with voter suppression. Why are we so interested in voter suppression if we are a democracy? Why do we not want everybody to vote? Why do we make it harder for people to vote? Why are we cutting down the days for early voting? Why are we cutting down the process for absentee voting? Why are we making it harder and not easier for people to vote? Why do we want to have voter suppression in a democracy? What do we say about these things if, in fact, we are the witnesses of the Lord? Be my witness. 
in Jerusalem. Everybody who's on this line and whoever sees this recording will see it from a different Jerusalem, a different city, a different neighborhood in the same city. Jerusalem is your unique place. It's where God has set you down to do ministry. Be, be a good witness in your own Jerusalem, in Charlotte or in Richmond or wherever you are in between or beyond, but not just in Jerusalem, in Judea, in your country, but not just parts of your country. Be my witness in Samaria. Samaria, those people. Jews made it a point not to go to Samaria. Jews had no regard for people who lived in Samaria. That's the funny thing about the parable of the Good Samaritan is that in the mind of the average Jewish person, while the parable, of course, is not called the Good Samaritan, we've taken that phrase not knowing that it is an oxymoron. That from the point of view of first century Jews, there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. No such thing as a person from Samaria who might act kindly toward us, and no such thing as a Samaritan toward whom we might act kindly. Samaria is the places we don't want to go. It's the people we don't want to meet. It's the problems we don't want to encounter. I believe that one of our Samarias is mass incarceration. It's what we allow to have locked up and tucked away so that we don't have to see it. Why do we have more people in prison in the United States than 26 other countries in the world combined? Is it because we have decided that rather than address our social inequities and resolve the problems that sometimes push people into criminal behavior, and I want to come back to the nature of that behavior in just a moment, is it because it is just easier to lock them up for 10, 12, 15, or 25, or 50 years, or life? or execute them, only to find out that perhaps they had not committed a crime at all. Do you know, when I was on the grand jury in Cleveland, Ohio, 70% of our cases were drug-related. And of those, the prosecutor wanted us to impose felony charges in every case and then spend $23,000 a year incarcerating every individual that we sent off to the state prison. When we could have spent $5,000 a year on the same person in drug rehabilitation. This is social justice. Don't send the person off to jail to become a more perfected crook. Give the person treatment for the addictions that they have and make them redeemed in our society and become contributing members as opposed to ex-felons who in many instances lose their right to vote and lose their right to have a quality life in this country. What is your Samaria? Where is the place? Who are the people? What are the problems? You could not drag your congregation to engage in if your life depended on it because they do not like those people. You have not engaged in ministry if you've done so inside your comfort zone. When I was the pastor at the church in Cleveland, 1987 to 2011, and by the way, I've come back. <laughs> I'm back in Cleveland now to serve as the interim pastor uh, for the same church because the pastor who was there after I left got a call to a church in Hampton, Virginia. 
So we came back to uh, live here again and to share with this lovely church. When I was here, it was clear to us, having done a survey of our neighborhood, inner city Cleveland, east side, deeply impoverished, full of drug addiction, full of alcoholism, full of domestic abuse, full of single parent families, full of people who have loved ones off in the penitentiary. It was clear to us, we cannot have a ministry that served only us. We had what we call two churches in one building. And we tried to make those two churches as interactive as we could. One church was our dues paying pew filling members. It's the crowd that comes around on scheduled times. The Sunday school crowd, the worship crowd, the Bible study crowd, the revival crowd, the church meeting crowd. That was one church. The other church showed up for loaves and fishes, which was the hunger program. The other crowd showed up for the agape program, the acronym, first of all, agape, God's unconditional love, but agape, action, growth, awareness, prevention, and education on the issue of HIV and AIDS. And we did HIV AIDS testing in the church building because that was our community. We had three Alcoholics Anonymous units because that is our community. We had a Head Start program because that was our community. We helped to build senior citizen housing because that was our community. 95% of our members of our first church took advantage of none of those things. But our ministry wasn't just to them. It was to our own version of Samaria. Do not think it was easy to persuade the church to get involved in all of these things. But Jesus, I said, sent us to Samaria and there we must go. Finally, I'll stop. The ends of the earth. We have, I think, an America first syndrome. I can't imagine where it came from. America first, America first. Let's leave the Paris peace talks, America first. Let's, let's leave the Trans-Pacific Partnership, America first. Let's get out of the nuclear deal with the Iranians. Why? America first. As if somehow uh, the only nation that matters, the only nation in the world uh, concerning whom we have to be concerned is America. Where in the Bible does it say, in the beginning, God created America? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we live in a global community. And if we got every single American vaccinated to the level of herd immunity for every single American uh, citizen, against COVID-19, if all of us had both of our shots, but we kept our international ports open so folks could continue to come to this country or we would leave here and go to other parts of the world not having been vaccinated, we would soon find out that America first does not mean America only. How do we bear witness to the fact that God is not provincial? That the God we serve is not regional? That social justice in the United States is not sufficient? Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, says the person who meant so much to me, Martin Luther King Jr. So I end with this story from the movie uh, Head of State. I'm assuming that because we started a little late, I can go a little longer. Uh, so I'll go just a little longer. In the movie The Head of State, Chris Rock, the comedian, 
is elected president of the United States and his brother, Bernie Mac, becomes the vice president. Now, I want you to imagine a country in which Chris Rock and Bernie Mac are president and vice president. I would like to live in that country just long enough to see what they would do with it. Well, we, we won't know because Bernie Mac is dead. But in the movie, while Chris Rock was campaigning for president, he was campaigning against a person who was obviously uh, a comic reincarnation of Dick Cheney. I mean, it was pretty clear, uh, given that time in history, that Cheney was the Republican candidate and uh, Chris Rock um, was the Democratic candidate. At the end of every one of this other person's campaign speeches, he would say, God bless America and no one else. Bad enough we say God bless America as if God doesn't have other fish to fry. God bless America and no one else. Speech after speech, crowd after crowd, up to the last debate, just before the election. God bless America and no one else. America first, America only. By the end of the campaign, Chris Rock had really had it with this guy. And so in his last address at the campaign a debate, when the other guy had just closed out with his God bless America and no one else. Chris Rock said this. How about God bless America and Haiti? How about God bless America and Cuba? How about God bless America and the nations of Africa? And then as if to make the point more dramatically, how about this? How about God bless America and everybody else? This ought to be our social justice vision. Not only that there be no poverty in this country, but that there be no poverty for any child any woman raising children, any nation on the earth, because God's agenda is not America first. God's agenda is everything that God has made. Irving Berlin wrote a wonderful patriotic song. As a Jewish immigrant into this country, having escaped the pogroms of Russia, at the turn of the 20th century, I'm not surprised that uh, a Russian Jewish songwriter would write God Bless America. It is his testimony to what the country has done for him. I have no problem with it. I just want you to know that that's not in God's hymn book. God doesn't want us to get stuck on God bless America. No, no. What God wants us to sing comes from my ancestors. What God wants us to sing comes from the cotton fields, the rice swamps, the tobacco patches, the sugarcane fields of slavery. Where people who kept being told that they were of no worth and of no value, that the only thing that they were good for was chopping cotton or chopping sugar cane or planting rice or hauling tobacco. And, and, and from somewhere, they looked up to encourage themselves and said, he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. God has the whole world in his hands. 
He has the little bitty baby in his hands. He has the wind and the waves in his hands. He has the sun and the moon in his hands. God is not an American. God is the creator of the ends of the earth, and it is to the ends of the earth that we are sent to do the work of justice, to be God's witness. Who will be a witness for my Lord? Amen. Thank you so very much, Dr. McMickle, for a wonderful, timely, uh, on target talk tonight. It really did get to the heart of what this whole conference is about, of uh, being called to justice issues. And I just want you to know how grateful I am for you being here, for you leading the way uh, with this talk in particular. I love the way that you analyzed this passage, this, this one verse uh, in such great detail as to talk about the way that it really does influence the way that we think of ourselves as a prophetic entity, i.e. the church. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by several things that you said. One of the things I want to start off with is uh, you brought up the word parhesia, and you talked about the way that uh, what we're called to do in this regard. Now, what does parhesia look like in a big steeple, uh, purplish, reddish purple congregation where people tend to turn off when you uh, say things that seem, quote unquote, political. Yeah. Well, um, that they've been conditioned by people who have been afraid to use parhesia. I don't blame the people. Mm -hmm. um, they've been they've been dealt a pretty steady diet of non-controversial, you know, spiritual formation sermons. And they've been steered around parts of the Bible where if they got introduced to it, they might realize that this is this is the heart of the matter. Yes. Now, this is the difference, though, uh, Dr. Sadler. I, I believe it comes more naturally to the black preacher than it does to the white preacher because the black preacher plays a very different role mm. within his or her community than the white preachers ever had to do. Uh, by and large, the white preacher has never had to uh, advocate for the sheer survival of his or her flock. Mm -hmm. there, were no, there, were, there were no existential threats to whiteness and therefore no need to build walls of protection or to identify the threats and call for action to just take care of the flock. Whereas the black preacher, uh, you know, Du Bois was saying, that, you know, the, the, the most important, the most unique person in American life was the black preacher because he or she uh, has such an important role to, to try to preserve mm -hmm. people's lives. Yes. And so I've got to talk this way for the sake of the people to whom I'm talking, one, to comfort them in the face of their afflictions, mm -hmm. But to, to challenge the people, the policies, the practices, the politics that are the cause of their dilemma. I want, I want to encourage uh, tall steeple churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, Lutheran churches, any church, to go back and read the Bible again. <laughs> you don't listen to me. Don't don't. Don't listen to, uh, you know, any liberation theologian that you think is somehow contorting it. Listen to Isaiah 58, verse 6. Listen when the people say to God, why do, why do we fast? Or just take out fasting. Why do we do all of our religious stuff? And God isn't happy. Why, why do we do these things and God doesn't seem to be pleased? And the prophet says, from God, because that's not the fast that I want. I don't want you sacrificing your children. I don't want you singing hymns. I don't want all of this religious stuff. Loose the bonds of wickedness. Lift the yoke of oppression. Let the oppressed go free. James Cone was right. 
beginning in 1969, we have written the real Jesus out of the Bible. And we've, re we've replaced him with a comforting Christ. We got to get back to liberation theology. I think we've got to get back to the notion that at the heart of the gospel is to let the oppressed go free. Here's a great time, by the way, for a shameless commercial. I've got a brand new book that just came out this month entitled Let the Oppressed Go Free. If you want to know what a tall steeple preacher should do, let the oppressed go free. And again, as I said about Ezekiel 3, better that you say it and they not like it than you not say it and God not like you. Preach. I think that will preach right there. Uh, we could go home <laughs> like a love offering at that point in time. Uh, but I, I got you for a few more minutes. So I want to ask you a couple more questions. One has sure. to do with this notion. A lot of what you say, I can hear some people saying, well, that sounds like partisan politics. That mm -hmm. sounds like uh, you're arguing for one side in this great bifurcation of the American political sphere. Yeah. I hear it as a legitimate moral critique that is precisely what prophets would say. How do you think that the uh, the attempt to politicize uh, and negatively, I use this term in a negative way, to politicize uh, issues of social concern, has that been done intentionally and has it been done to serve a particular purpose? Well, you know, we weren't the first ones to co-op God. I mean, let's start with that. We, we're not the ones who took the Bible and twisted it to a political end. Slavery was created and sustained by the twisting of biblical materials to justify somebody's political reality. Uh, the whole notion uh, of the white evangelical conservative community is that they have a view, a reading of scripture that supports a view of the world. Okay, so do I. Um, I want to quote uh, President Biden as he responds to those who tell him that his COVID relief plan is too big. Uh, a political critique. And his answer is what my answer is. Which part of the justice agenda shall we take out? Which part don't you like? Do you, do you not like the part where we take care of small business? Do you not like the part where we fund state and local government? Do you not like the part where we take care of people living in poverty who've lost their jobs because of COVID-19? Which part of the attack on the U.S. Capitol shall I overlook? What is it about the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers that you want to keep? What, what is it that I have said that you wish I had left unsaid because it is either unchristian or unpatriotic? Now, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid of the dialogue. Hearing an opposing point of view doesn't send me into hiding. It perks my ears up because I want to hear what you have to say in response. It is when people want to say their point of view and are closed off to the possibility that they could be wrong, that maybe their reading of scripture is not supportable. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying here's what I believe. I've tried to root that in scripture, not in opinion. I haven't quoted one African-American congressperson in this presentation, but I did quote from Moses. I did quote from Ezekiel. I did quote from Elijah. I did quote from Jesus. I did quote from Paul. Now, what about them don't you like? Amen. Amen. I think that will preach. We had a question that came in from uh, Sabre Nap Napier in the the uh, the chat that asked about uh, how do churches identify their Samaria. I might rephrase that question slightly by saying, uh, when I was at Duke, director of Black Church Studies at Duke uh, back in the early parts of 2000, I remember there was a big controversy uh, because the students said, "Why are we focusing on racial justice in South Africa?" and not on racial justice in North Durham. Uh, yeah. So how do we begin as the congregation to recognize our responsibility to uh, deal with those people that are around us, but quote unquote, we don't think of as us, A, and B, yeah. 
how do we deal with the fact that uh, part of the resistance might be because there's complicity in the status of the people that we are trying to ignore? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, let's go back to Jesus and his response to the disciples. Be my witness in four places. Now, see something, say something, and be prepared to suffer something for the sake of what you've said in Jerusalem. So as I said earlier on, don't start uh, on the other side of the world. There's no particular reason for us to be so focused on South Africa or South America if we live in the South Bronx and aren't saying anything about that. So start in your Jerusalem and then your country. Now, Samaria is simply the people in your Jerusalem or in your Judea, it's just the people you don't like. It's the ones you don't care if they get better or not. It's Jonah getting mad with God because he knew that if he went to Nineveh and preached to them, he'd find out the hard way that God loved them as much as God loved Jonah and Jonah's people. It's Jesus in Luke 4 declaring himself to be the Messiah, having read the text, and the people marvel. But then when he says in the days of Elijah, the prophet went to a, a woman from Sidon and Elijah went to a leper in Syria and they wanted to kill him because he was saying, God loves beyond your circle. Who don't we care about? We go to them because God does care about them. And it is when we don't love the folk that God loves, that two bad things happen. One, they don't receive the grace that we can bring. And we've earned God's displeasure because we've loved too safely. Amen, amen. Uh, another question from the audience comes in from John Quinn. If Jesus were to make a brief appearance in 2021, what do you hope he would say to make it clear that he expects of us, uh, what he expects of us on social justice and racial justice and building his kingdom on earth? What might Jesus say? Yeah, um, in the book I've just written, I, I start off with pretty well established notions of liberation. Liberation on basis of race, it's pretty well known. Uh, the second phase of liberation theology is Latin American. So it's liberation based upon poverty. Third phase deals with matters of gender. I think we're starting to get now, you see, into a more contemporary argument. It's, it's, it's what is the role, the liberties, the rights, the freedoms of all women, and then becomes womanist theology. What are the peculiar and unique burdens of being an African-American woman living in poverty, trying to, trying to navigate the world in which we live. And then we come to queer theology or LGBTQ theology and the rights of persons in that community. Now, bear in mind today, the House has just passed a new program to celebrate the rights of the LGBTQ community, but I'm not sure that most folks in many churches are there. So I think he'd be looking there. Oh, I can hear them now saying, what about Leviticus 18, 22 and Romans 1, 23 and 24? And I would say, yeah, I don't know. I don't think Jesus would want anybody eating in red lobster, wearing a silk and wool suit, criticizing LGBTQ people. Stop picking the verses that you like and ignoring all the rest. And finally, Native Americans. For the first time, the Secretary of the Interior may be a Native American woman. If you want to see suffering in this world, don't, don't, don't look even in the black community. There's no place in this country worse than some of these windswept Native American reservations. He would ask us to look at the places I had a doctoral student at Russia at Colgate who said, if the only thing you want is freedom from your own from your own oppression, but you don't care about the oppression of others, 
then you don't want liberation. You just want privilege. So who do you care for beyond your own group? That's what I would say. Amen. I love that notion of caring for people beyond our own group. Back to the, when you raised that point about uh, about sin and the picking and choosing in Leviticus, yeah. uh, often uh, recognize that Americans, we tend to think of the two worst things that we can commit uh, are abortion and homosexuality. Yeah. And this seems to be the platform that often uh, is used by a conservative agenda. And always strikes me as odd that the two things that are worse are the two things that cisgendered straight men can't do. That's yeah. the thing that God hates the most. <laughs> yeah, it's safe for them. It's like yeah. 75 year old white males in Congress spending all their time worrying about women's reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what's it got to do with you? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. You know, there were in the 80s and 90s two Sundays that were called uh, Justice Sundays within a certain circle of conservative Christians. Mm -hmm. And and both of those Justice Sundays were focused on abortion and homosexuality. Here's my question to my brothers and sisters for whom those are the issues. If the world tomorrow morning looked the way you want the world to look mm -hmm. on the matters of abortion and homosexuality, if those issues were gone, would the perfect kingdom of God, the beloved community, then be fully established hmm. because those were the only two problems standing in the way. If the answer is no, no, there are still some other things that are obstacles to the better world, then why aren't those other things on your agenda? Why is the only thing you want to talk about those two yes. and you leave a dozen other things undiscussed? Exactly. Yeah, so no, I'm not going to have any discussion about abortion and homosexuality that doesn't involve prison reform and feeding the hungry and adequate housing and police brutality and on and on and on. Amen, amen. I want to get back to the prison reform question in a second, but I want to start off, though, with the notion of vision casting. Do we do a good enough job with vision casting as the church? It almost seems as though we are, uh, we are, submitted to the fact that what exists around us, the is, is yeah. all that can be. And it seems as though the gospel is constantly pushing us towards that larger notion of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, a place where uh, all debt is canceled, a place where the sick are healed, the place where uh, all needs are met. Uh, how do we begin to expand our vision casting as a community? Yeah. And see, I think here the danger is if we let the vision emerge from within ourselves, that is our vision, as opposed to simply what, what you just did, you see, what you just did was you just took Isaiah 63 and Luke 4 and a few other biblical references that deal with what the kingdom or the reign of God will look like uh, from the point of view of a messianic hope. And said, so this is, this is what the Lord wants. This is not a secret. We don't have to go out and have uh, a study group that, that says, what does the Lord require of us? My goodness, how many times does he have to say it? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a stream. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison, I was a stranger, and you either did or did not do something about it. We can lift the vision. The question is, will the people follow? That's up to them. Yeah, where there is no vision, people perish. We lift up the vision of what God has asked us to be and to do and invite them to follow. Amen. I love that notion. Uh, we're not called to be successful. Yeah. We're called to be faithful. We're called Mother to be faithful. Thus yeah. says the Lord. And yeah. then yeah. the Lord will. And that's a yeah. hard thing. That's a hard thing for people who are in the midst of a success oriented world. Yeah. Uh, the way that we're called to think. Oh, you talked about prison reform. I want us to get back to this as an issue. Uh, when we think about prison reform, we think about the fact that uh, we have mass incarceration of African American males. What is it? Uh, statistics suggest that one in three African American men born. From 2000, since 2000, we'll end up at some point in time in prison. 
Currently, one in nine African American men are in prison or under the supervision of the criminal justice system. Uh, there is a significant racial dimension to this notion of prison reform. Uh, yeah. What part is the church's responsibility, not only to argue for prison reform, but to work against the racial dynamics that fostered mass incarceration of black males and females? Yeah, uh, there, there probably are several layers to that. The first one is what are we prepared to publicly say about what you just said? How do we confront it if we are not prepared to actually see it and to hear it as a reality and say black people do not commit crimes or use drugs at any higher ratio than anybody else? So the question is not that we are more criminal than somebody else, it is that we are more criminalized by the justice system than other persons. We are the ones who are stopped on the street. We are the ones who have to say to our sons and our daughters, if you get stopped by the police, this is what you have to do so you don't end up dead. I don't know a single white person, I don't know, that there could be, who had to have the talk, the talk with their children about what to do if they get stopped by the police. How many times is a white person stopped by the police in relationship to the black population? So it begins with the way in which we are policed in America. Then it begins with cash bail. See, a lot of folks can't post bail. They don't have the money to post bail. So they stay in jail. In staying in jail, they lose their job because they can't go out to work. They lose their job. They can't take care of their family. They can't pay off their bills. Do you know that everything that happened in Ferguson, Missouri, all of those combustible issues in that community were in relationship to arrest and cash bail and keeping people, fining people for this, fining people for that. So we are handled differently in the criminal justice system. I think um, there is a presumption on the part of many that all black men are dangerous. You and I have PhD degrees. I can't speak for you, but I know that every time I walk down the street, there's a six foot four African-American male. There are people who see me coming and are terrified at the thought of what I might do to them. Nothing. I don't even have you on my mind, but the sight of me triggers in some people the suspicion that I'm a danger. If I am a danger doing nothing, how do I then enjoy full citizenship rights? Prison reform, of course, has to do with prison overcrowding. It has to do with an equitable sentencing. It has to do with the degree to which we are the victims of the death penalty and not uh, you know, some prolonged uh, sentence. It's it's prison without parole. There are so many things in our criminal justice system that are the problem. But the first problem is that America just uses its prisons as social service agencies. We send all our problems to prison. Other countries don't do that. Now, what, what might we decriminalize in order to reduce our prison population. Should we put in prison people whose crime is the possession of a certain amount of marijuana? When I was on the grand jury in Cleveland, I was the foreman. All the cases came through me. 50% of all the drug cases were not people who were caught using the drug. They were caught with a crack pipe no crack in the pipe, mind you. But they put the pipe under scientific study to see if there had ever been the use of crack. They called it residue. And on the basis of crack residue, they would then arrest the person. If you had $100 of cash and a cell phone and you were in a car, they charge you with four felonies. You are a drug dealer because you have money. 
you are transporting drugs because you're in a car and you're a drug user because there was residue, then they say, now, which of these four charges do you want to accept? And we'll throw the other three out. So you take the least offensive, a felony five, but you're now a felon because of the residue or because you had cash or because you're in a car. They don't stop white folk like that. They don't, they don't, they just don't. And it is an unequitable and, and immoral system. Amen. And you talk about this as an unequitable and immoral system. To what extent did the church's view of black and brown folk from uh, 1619 till today influence the way that we are criminalized, hypersexualized, uh, viewed as villains, viewed as less intelligent, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. You know, Dr. Sadler, if you want to build your economy on an agricultural basis, and the cheapest way to do it is to have forced human labor, but the theological problems of Philemon and the theological questions of whether a Christian can hold another Christian in slavery for life, you got to find a way to deal with those theological and biblical issues. So in order to do it, you have to dehumanize. You know, you have to commodify the person. Well, once you dehumanize a person by whatever means, what, once you rob them of humanity, then you can do anything with them and you can do anything to them, including the nature of the punishment that you can heap on them for not doing what it is you want them to do. I think that every lynching, Every form of police brutality is a residual effect of the initial effort to dehumanize African-American people and Native American people. Once you say African-Americans are three-fifths of a person and Native Americans are not even to be counted, once you let Andrew Jackson impose the Indian Removal Act that sends five Native American tribes from the east side of the Mississippi River to the west side, and you completely uproot these populations, why? To expand slavery and expand the production of cotton. You've now built your entire economy on a slave system and on a system of Native American elimination. This is the natural consequence of that initial act of dehumanization. Now, how does the church redeem that? None of that would have happened if white preachers had spoken up. And none of this would continue if white Christians said no. It is the silence of the church, says King. Not the vitriolic word, the vitriolic words of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people that is the root cause of our problem. I invite all of your white Presbyterian pastors and your white Presbyterian members to ask themselves, when is the last time they said anything about the immorality of the things that we're discussing now? And if the answer is, we've never gotten around to that, then my response is, be my witness. See it, say it, Amen. and suffer for it. Amen. And you just you just opened up the last question I wanted to get to because the last question had to do with that notion of witnessing. Uh, you talked about witnessing and equated it in part to bearing witness to the voice of those whose voices aren't heard. Yeah. How yeah. does a uh, comfortable congregation become acquainted with those who are marginalized? And how do they begin authentically to bear witness to their words? How do they, uh, I don't want them to represent those people, these people, these communities, but to walk alongside of them. Does that require relationship building? What else does it require in order to authentically lift up their voices? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to hear the truth about their condition. I, I think sometimes people just don't know how bad it is. You know, in the 1960s, before, Birmingham and Selma, white Americans had heard about racial segregation and brutality, 
but they had never seen it because it wasn't happening necessarily around them. And then CBS showed up when they turned on the fire hoses in Birmingham. And CBS and ABC and NBC and the British Broadcasting Corporation showed up on Bloody Sunday. And we saw it and began to feel it. Well, we see it every day. Gustavo Gutierrez writing in Theology of Liberation says, nobody can say that they have not seen poverty. All they can say is, I don't care about what I've seen. My friend Bill Jones used to ask this interesting question. He said, a little boy was once asked this question, which is worse, ignorance or apathy? And the little boy's answer was, I don't know, and I don't care. And I think what we have to do is help people to know by telling their stories, using videos, inviting persons to come into our churches who represent that reality, challenging not at the local church level alone, though. It's not just so-and-so-and-so -and -so Presbyterian church on the corner of. That's too small a fist to ball up. It's the National Presbyterian Church taking a stand at its annual gatherings that these are the things we think it means to be who we say we are. And let that word go out. Put this burden on your national leadership, on your on your moderator, on whatever, you know, whatever the, the top E is. That's where it's got to start. And let it filter down from there. Now, does that person want to say it? Will the presidents of these seminaries say it? Will the faculty say it? Will the moderator of the synods say it? Or whatever the other uh, Presbyterian things are? Who's going to say it? But if you don't say it, then we're not going to know it. And we're going to live as if these things don't really exist. So see it, say what, say something about what you've seen, and be prepared to suffer something for the sake of what you've said. If you don't want to suffer something, nothing will change. Amen. Amen. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, see it, say it. I love that as a nice way to summarize what you've talked about tonight as bearing witness and going forward bearing witness. You are truly one of the great voices of this era uh, in terms of what the church needs to do, what we need to be about. And I'm grateful to you for spending some time with us uh, over the last two days. I'm grateful for you for pouring into us your wisdom, your analysis of this passage from Acts and uh, the way that you got it to speak to us in new ways about so many different social issues that we have to address. It has been truly a blessing to hear from you, an honor to be uh, able to sit at your feet uh, at this moment. Uh, I want to say our, our president, Dr. Blunt, uh, was uh, not able to be here at the end because of technological issues, but wanted to just say that he uh, wanted me to give you his gratitude and let him know, uh, let you know that he was uh, thinking about how wonderful this event was. Uh, one of the last things you said, I'm going to make a shameless plug for some other work the center is doing. Uh, you lifted up this notion of people need to hear the voices. We're working yes. on a project called Rap Track, the Reimagining America Project, Truth, Reconciliation, and Atonement Commission for Charlotte, which is a truth and reconciliation process. And one of the things we're trying to do is to hear the voices of those who've been uh, experiencing racial disparity because of the, of the fact that they're African American in this country. We've looked at issues of health care. We've looked at issues of uh, housing and housing insecurity. We've looked at issues of the criminal justice system, and we're about to take on issues of uh, education. Uh, we invite everybody to be a part of this great work. This is work that we really do need to do across the country. But Dr. McMichael, we are grateful for your witness this evening and for all that you have done for us. Let me do this. Let me close this out tonight with a word of prayer. Holy One, you have been great and gracious to us. You have, over the last two days, given us an opportunity to wrestle with some key concerns. How do we as the church preach about social justice? How do we as the church teach about social justice? How do we talk about issues of race and racial disparity? 
And how do we activate ourselves so that we might become agents of change in the midst of this larger world? And tonight, Lord, we have been blessed again uh, by the Reverend Dr. Marvin McNichol to really wrestle with the way that you have charged us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of this earth. Lord, we want to ask that you would be with each of those people who've led us in these conversations and continue to bless them, their ministries. Be with each of the people that has joined for these conversations and help them to be truly opened up to the way that your word and your will work in their lives, that they may be your witnesses in an age that needs to hear from you. Lord, as we go away from this evening, we are open to you. We are available to you. And we ask that you would use us, that your kingdom may come, that your will would be done. As it is in heaven, so may it be on earth. For Christ's sake, amen. 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 God bless you. See you all and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be talking soon about the next uh, Just Talk, Talk Just. Uh, which will occur within the next month. And please be on the lookout for all of the programs that the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation does, the Katie Geneva Cannon Center for Womanist Leadership does, and also the Center, uh, the uh, Leadership Institute of Union Presbyterian Seminary has to offer for you all. God bless you and good night. <laughs>